listening to Hard Talk with me, Zainab Badawi. All sanctions relating to Iran's nuclear program have been lifted in a deal that's been labelled historic. Iran's President Hassan Rouhani said a golden page in the country's history had begun. My guest is the former British Foreign Secretary Jack Straw, who served under Tony Blair. He's been a long-time supporter of closer ties with Iran and has visited the country many times. But what is his response to critics who believe the rapprochement with Iran will bolster the hardliners in the country, exacerbate regional rivalries and fuel terror and instability in the Middle East? Jack Straw, welcome to Hard Talk. Thank you. The Iranian Foreign Minister Mohammad Javid Zarif said that the lifting of sanctions on Iran would be good for Iran, good for the region and good for the world. Is he right? Yes, he is. Uh, and if people doubt that, they need to think about what the alternative would have been. If sanctions had not been lifted, if Iran remained in a, quote, pariah state, what would then have happened? What would have happened, in my view, is if the sanctions change had not been agreed by the United States, by President Obama, is that the hardliners in Iran would have eclipsed President Rouhani and the nuclear program, nuclear weapons program, which is generally accepted in intelligence circles, has been in abeyance since about 2009 at least. That would have restarted. So the world for sure would have become a more dangerous place. This virtually guarantees that Iran, even if it wants to, can't restart its nuclear weapons program for 15 years. So you're totally satisfied that the verification process and all the checks that the Americans say will be there and will be carried out very vigorously, you're satisfied that they are I sufficient? am, within the realms of human possibility. Um, you can never be completely satisfied, but nuclear weapons programs are much more difficult to hide, for example, than chemical and biological weapons programs. And the IAEA, the International agency responsible for checking all this is all over Iran and has a lot, a lot of background knowledge as well. The key country, of course, is the United States, often referred to in the past by Iran as the great Satan. And of course, you know, Iran was part of the axis of evil for the Americans and so on. So a very, very key relationship. And you have got people in the United States who are very concerned. Obama, of course, is going to be on his way out, you know, in a year's time. I'll just give you one example. Marco Rubio, who's one of the Republican mm. presidential candidates, said he has fought Obama for rewarding Iran despite its atrocious human rights record. Uh, there, there is a lot of mistrust still. Oh, there's huge mistrust. And if you go into Tehran, and I was there uh, in October, um, you go past the American embassy compound. Uh, it has the slogan still written uh, on the walls, uh, death to America. Uh, the British embassy, when we're, we're in the same company. In Little terms, Satan. Little Satan. The UK or, 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 or the brainy Satan. Um, I say we're in the same company uh, and uh, the side street around our compound is, is the Bobby Sands Street, named after the uh, IRA the Northern uh, Ireland. bomber uh, who, mm. who starved himself to death in the early 80s. But it's more uh, the mistrust in the United States but, I was talking but, about, yeah, a key but, nation. But of course there is huge mistrust amongst part of uh, the public in the United States. Some of that's been whipped up by the Israelis under Bibi Netanyahu, the Prime Minister in Israel, because they've had you know, an equal degree of mistrust. It's also, and this may sound patronising, there is, uh, however, amongst the body politic in the United States, amongst part of it, there is a level of under-information verging on ignorance about international affairs, which is sometimes terrifying. But it is that terrifying. ignorance, though. I mean, when he says that Iran has an atrocious human rights well, record, I mean, he's got a point, hasn't he? It, Amnesty International yeah. say Iran executes but, more people than any other yeah. country apart from China. 160 juvenile offenders currently uh, on death look, row. Iran, Iran has a very poor human rights record. Um, but is that a reason for not agreeing to this deal in respect of nuclear weapons? I suspect, I don't know, I suspect that the reformers who have agreed this deal would also like to see a change in Iran's human rights record. And bear in mind that the judiciary and elements of the security service, the people who, who arrest uh, people in Iran, are not within the control of the elected government. Not at all. So this, what this does is strengthen the reformers' hands generally. But I'd also say, yes, China has a pretty awful human rights uh, record. So does Saudi Arabia an absolutely atrocious 
human rights record and terrible record in terms of the treatment of women, far worse than the <laughs> treatment of women okay. in Iran. And two, don't forget that in Senator Rubio's home state, Texas, they have one of the worst records he, he, look, of capital punishment as well. Okay, he is just one. He is just one of many voices. But the point is, uh, you can't just uh, criticise the messenger because there is substance to well, that message. And yeah. I'll just give you another example when we talk about Iran, because I'm thinking very much that Mohammad Javid Zarif, the foreign minister, said, "Look, no country has won. This is a kind of draw." But this idea that Iran is being rewarded, even though it's not being asked to change its behaviour in any way, other than in the new clear programs. Kenneth Pollock, former official of the US National Security Council, says the Iranians tend to back Shia populations and they often incite them to violence and provide them with the wherewithal to do so. As a result, the Iranians have become deeply embroiled in the civil wars of the region. Well, that's true. Uh, and it's also true in an equal or opposite way, so far as Saudi Arabia is concerned, uh, which is embroiled on the other way. But the, the, the question, it, it's, it's a given uh, that Iran, the leader of the minority Shia community within the Muslim world, should have a natural association and affinity with the other Shia communities in the Lebanon, in Syria, in, in Iraq, and along the Gulf, as well as in the western part of Afghanistan. That's just a given. The question is, how do you engage with Iran in those circumstances? Sorry, so can I just interrupt you there? Yeah. A given that <coughs> they'll engage with well, Shia, uh, uh, sympathise yes. and empathise. What <coughs> even... <coughs> President Bashar al-Assad, an Alawite, which is an offshoot of Shiism, who is responsible for the bulk I, of, I, look, I, of, of deaths, a quarter of a million in I, Syria, and he is a key ally of the Iranians. Well, That's understandable, isn't well, it, I, in I, the I, context I, I, of Shia as, as a matter of loyalty. social and, and geographic loyalties and historic connections, yes, and this, that, that's not in the, in the least to excuse uh, President Assad uh, and his brutal regime. And but his allies, and, the Iranians, because we've got the and, Revolutionary Guard who are fighting on the ground no, and, alongside and, Assad. And, and his allies, although the, the Syrian conflict, as you know, is incredibly uh, complicated because you've also got the Assad regime being supported by uh, the Shia, yes, but also by the Christians, who feel very far more under threat well, from, from, the, from, from, from the Sunni and, uh, and some uh, Sunni business people as well. Now, the question is, is not, are you going to break these long-standing historic uh, social and ethnic connections? What do you do about them? And you're far more likely, from my own long experience of dealing uh, with Iran and with other countries, to be able to deal constructively with these, uh, a country like Iran and get Iran to help if Iran is around the table. If you, for example, you want this, some political solution to the Syrian civil war, which for sure we do, you've got to have Iran around the table. And, by the by, also Russia. And the first Geneva Accords on Syria were doomed to failure because the British government and the United States government decided to exclude Iran from that. So, and the reverse is also true. If Iran is round the table, they've already made it clear, and so has Russia, yeah. that yes, Assad will have to be part of the solution in terms of the agreement, but as soon as there has been a peace, the Assad family's future will lie elsewhere, and they will be pretty brutal about that. But uh, you talk about the need to have Iran at the table, and we'll just look at the regional impact then of the implications of Iran coming in from the cold, because Saudi Arabia, of course, the major Sunni Arab uh, or the Sunni Muslim force in the region, huge rivalry with the Iranians, and we see all kinds of proxy wars being played out between the two of them, the Iranians backing the Houthis in the Yemen civil war, Syrians, as we just discussed already, and, you know, all sorts of rivalries in the region. The Saudis are jolly unhappy about this rapprochement. Yes, they are. Uh, and I think one of the reasons why President Obama pushed this rapprochement is precisely to make the Saudis unhappy. It may sound odd, but I think that there was real anxiety in Washington and in a lot of European capitals about the direction of travel of the Saudi regime and its potential instability. Uh, and I believe that part of the sub-agenda of uh, these talks and this rapprochement has been to secure a different balance of power in the Gulf. And if the West is able to achieve, it won't be a, an alliance with Iran, but normal business with Iran and is able to use them in terms of foreign policy as well. That will make relations with Saudi Arabia uh, more balanced. And I think is I'm, that I, a strategy I, you back? 
it have is Iran as a counterweight to Saudi Arabia? Absolutely. You do. I, Why? I, do you believe that the West, including the United Kingdom, is too close to Saudi Arabia? I, th I think it needs to be rebalanced. And I think that if it is rebalanced, it will help those elements in Saudi Arabia who want to see Saudi Arabia internally reformed, just as the process of breaking out of the trap of sanctions in Iran has actually, in the long run, helped the reform. I'll ask you about that in uh, just so one the, second. The same but just to finish the Saudi Saudi Arabia. So just to finish so, on the Saudi uh, thing, yeah. could, do you believe that that's the correct strategy? And is that because you feel that the United Kingdom and other Western nations are too close to Saudi well, Arabia? Because there's an implicit criticism I think look, look, I mean, about Saudi you, Arabia. You, you can criticise me for, for this, but in, in the absence of an Iran with whom we could have a proper relationship, there was only, in a sense, one serious capital in the Middle East, and that was Riyadh. Uh, that's now changed, and I think that's m much healthier. We want the best relations we can have uh, with Saudi Arabia, but it has to be on terms where they acknowledge that they have a, 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 a neighbour across the Persian Gulf who has a different set of viewpoints and they've got to work with them. I'm mean, also concerned, let me say too, about the internal situation in Saudi Arabia and they need to, if central uh, council within Saudi Arabia need to think about that. But when David Cameron, the British Prime Minister, says that the relationship with Saudi Arabia is important for our security here in the UK, what do you make of that then? Well, is he wrong or is he no, right no, to make that statement? He, he's right that it's important and we certainly don't want to see Saudi Arabia going belly up. But you want to dilute that close relationship I, by I the sounds don't, of I it. don't see it as a zero sum. I don't think that if we end up with a better relationship with Iran, this somehow sucks the, the, the power and, and influence out of the relationship with Saudi Arabia. The, the sensible approach in international diplomacy is to try and have good relations with all. But also, if, if you want to sec secure better stability uh, within that region, you've got to have Saudi Arabia and Iran finally accepting that their destiny in that region, however difficult it, it's going to be, lies together. You've but got that's to not going to happen, is it? When the Saudi well, Arabian foreign ministry says Iran's record has been one of fear and destruction, terrorism, destabilisation, interference in the affairs of other countries, that's just one quote there from the Saudi foreign minister. And we also had Jamal Khashoggi, a, a Saudi Arabian journalist, um, who has been quoted and also is a former advisor to former foreign minister Saudi Arabia, Turki al Faisal, saying that if Iran gets hold of, of a nuclear bomb, then Saudi Arabia will. I mean, what you're well, saying I mean, is not going to happen. You may wish it, but it's not, it's not going to happen. And OK, so that, I mean, the foreign, current foreign minister is somebody who gets quite excited, a very sharp contrast to his predecessor. That's Adil al Jubaid. Yeah, yeah. Adil al Jubaid. Uh, in contrast to his predecessor, Prince Saud al Faisal, who, who I, I don't think would have said things uh, or, or in this way. Um, look, you've got a terrible hopeless, hopeless in the sense, no, no end to it, civil war in the Yemen. The only way in which that can be resolved is by uh, negotiations with Saudi Arabia and Iran, because they're fighting a proxy war. Uh, they have negotiations, maybe brokered in, in turn by the United States, Russia and the EU. They've got to start trying to live together. And Obama's strengthening of the Iranian uh, government, in my view, enhances that prospect. All right. Do you condone um, Saudi's actions in Yemen and, and by implication also Britain's involvement in military I'm, advisory capacity, that kind of thing? Uh, no, I don't. I'm really worried about this civil war in the Yemen. Uh, and quite and some, Saudi's intervention. And, yeah, and, and Saudi's intervention. And Iran's intervention as well. Uh, but I'm worried too about, the, as it tr turns out, that uh, it seems that British military personnel are involved in giving assistance in terms of targeting. Nobody I speak to who knows the Yemen much, much better than do I thinks that this conflict in the Yemen, military conflict, can end but anything with more tears. And there is no and this and the Yemen is are uh, renowned for just carrying on fighting. Um, and so there's so should be, Britain then stop it's support. My, my view is, I think we need, it, unless there is a far, far better explanation offered about what we are doing supporting the Saudis in uh, the Yemen, uh, that we should withdraw that support and work for a political solution. Because there uh, are concerns, as you know, that there have been airstrikes by the know, Saudis, no. which have uh, killed civilians and also I, even one Médecins Sans Frontières hospital. No, I'm, so I'm very concerned about that. And I mean, sometimes I, I, I defend the, the British government's policy of supporting the US and French and others in the strikes uh, in Syria and northern Iraq. And yes, sometimes civilians will be killed, but I'm, I think uh, 
that sometimes is a very sad consequence of necessary action. But I don't see the same case so far as the Yemen uh, is concerned. It's a little reported war so far as the West is concerned, but it's very serious and has huge potential for destabilization. And the thing I don't quite understand is how the Saudis think they can contain this within the, the borders of the Yemen, because the borders between the Yemen and Saudi Arabia are very, very, very porous indeed. Yeah. But uh, just to pick a final thing on this Saudi-Iranian uh, rivalry before we come back to Iran, is it's not just Saudi Arabia that's suspicious of Iran, is it? I mean, you've got other Gulf countries, key countries like Kuwait, Bahrain, Sudan, further afield Yes, there you have, but, it, but, it's, but it's complicated. I mean, you, certainly Kuwait and certainly Bahrain, but don't forget that in Bahrain there is a sheer majority. Yes, no. Uh, yeah. and, and the Iranians will say they have... But the leadership, the leadership. Oh, the leadership, certainly. Yeah. If you go to the UAE... And they've all downgraded or ended sure. their they diplomatic the UAE, ties. Yeah. They are they're politically very concerned uh, about relations with Iran, but they also will say perfectly open to, openly to you uh, that they accept that Dubai particularly is going to benefit hugely from increased trade with Iran. And although I, I, I don't buy into this, what I think is a, a naive view that improved trade relations always spell improved security relationships, I'm not in any doubt that if you can improve trade uh, and raise the common interests, then you reduce the security threats to countries. And I'm sure that the wiser council in UAE will recognise that. And then further down uh, the Gulf uh, and the other side of the Gulf, in Oman, mm. they're completely relaxed about uh, Iran and actually very yeah. happy about what's happened. All right, going back to Iran now, you've said uh, several times now that you believe that the um, lifting of sanctions relating to Iran's nuclear program, because of course the United States has left some there, like the dollar exchange yeah. restrictions because of Iran's ballistic missiles program, and indeed it's just put a, a, a new sanctions on 11 individuals in Iran and entities. Um, so th th those still exist. But in terms of the nuclear sanctions, uh, th they have gone. And you've consistently said that's going to bolster the moderates at the expense of the hardliners. Why are you so sure of that? Why? Because uh, I've, I've developed some understanding of the dynamics of politics uh, within Iran. I don't claim complete expertise. Because you've I, always, I should just say, by way of background, advocated dialogue well, with have, the Iranians I, I, and you, you were the first key Western politician I, I, to visit when I you were was, Foreign Secretary. I was, and I visited mm. just a couple of weeks after 9-11. At that stage, President Khatami of Iran, um, President Rouhani's predecessor and a, a key reformer who'd been elected... Well, there was Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, yeah, with, between, yeah, between Ahmadinejad. Yeah. Yeah. He, he, he'd been elected in, nine, in 97 uh, and was trying to... He was a reformist. He was president. a reformist. Yeah. He was trying to open things up. So you then had 9-11. In Baghdad, Saddam Hussein organised celebrations against the Americans to celebrate the fact that al-Qaeda had taken down the Twin Towers. In sharp contrast, President Khatami organised torchlight processions and vigils in sympathy with the victims of 9-11. He reached out to the West. That's one of the key reasons why I went there so quickly. Uh, and the consequence was that Afghan Iran was fantastically helpful mm. to the West yeah. over Afghanistan until President uh, Bush pulled the rug from un under the uh, feet of the Iranians okay. with his axes of evil uh, speech. Now, sure. you but just looking at the present no, now, but, but why saying, do you think well, the moderates well, well, will be well, strengthened? For, for the same reason, Zainab, because um, if the West helps the moderates, then they will help us. But, and the reverse is also true, as I saw so starkly in the years after the Axis of Evil speech, in which Iran was lumped in with Iraq. But you don't know, though, that, because we know that there, there are a lot of businesses in Iran that are attached to the Revolutionary Guard. We know that um, there are concerns, again, in Saudi Arabia and other Gulf states, that this, you know, $100 billion that's often being quoted now as, you know, sanctions relief one way or another will come to Iran in time, is going to be used for Iran to simply meddle some more in the region. Well, they're meddling, I mean, all, all these countries. Big they're countries. meddling anyway, so yeah. they, they can well, meddle well, some more. Well, look, all the big countries in the region. No, I meant with Iran no, no, specifically. Saudi, they could use Saudi the money Arabia, for that. Saudi, no, but just with Iran, no, 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 I understand they could that, use the I'm, money for that. Well, they, they could. I don't think they will. Um, moreover, it's the people in the Revolutionary Guards and the businesses they control who have done very well, thank you, out of sanctions, and who've been most opposed to President Rouhani beginning this rapprochement and signing this deal. Uh, and 
they were putting the supreme leader, Ali Khamenei, under very great pressure to refuse authority to Rouhani mm. and to Zarif to but make the deal. We are where we are but now, we are. though. So, so, where, are, where, so, yeah. so you're asking me, how can I be certain? You yeah. can never be absolutely certain in international relations, but I'm far more certain than I was that this deal will help the moderates on this 100 billion. It's not going to be 100 billion standing in the turn. Okay, no, no, I know. It's, it's, it's yeah, it's, gradually. It's, 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 well, it will happen gradually. And the Iranian economy needs investment. Uh, Iranian infrastructure is desperate for investment. Of course, so there's all that. 68 million people, they need to see some economic so, benefits. So the, on. But it's just this thing that you cannot be certain because you've asserted it. And we, we know that, uh, you know, Khamenei and the other conservative, the hardliners, for instance, 55% of the 12,000 candidates, prospective candidates for parliamentary elections in February have been prevented course, yeah, from standing sure. because they are two reformists. So, you know, there's still a long way to, to oh, go it's a on huge that. Way to go. You accept that. Yeah, yeah. I want to ask you, though, as a senior uh, Labour figure about uh, your party because uh, when it comes to action like the intensified airstrikes against uh, Syria and the British uh, the Royal Air Force came in belatedly the, the Jeremy Corbyn the Labour leader new Labour leader was opposed to that you had key members of the shadow cabinet like the foreign shadow foreign secretary Hillary Benn supporting airstrikes is that kind of position tenable in the long run to have a key figure like Hillary Benn so out of step with his leader well Hillary was uh, supporting a, a substantial proportion of the parliamentary party. Um, it's just a, it's just something we've got to live with at the moment, uh, that the party is, I'm afraid, divided. That's a, a consequence of the il electoral system that produced uh, a leader, Jeremy Corbyn, perfectly legitimately elected, who's got a different set sure. of views from the majority of the But is it tenable? I mean, I just have to ask a parallel. When you were Foreign Secretary, you supported the invasion of Iraq. I did. And Tony Blair, of course, yeah. was a huge proponent of that. But just suppose, for the sake of argument, you were out of step like Hillary Benn is with Jeremy Corbyn. Would you have remained in Tony Blair's government if oh, you not, not, differed not with him? Not in government, no. I mean, I differed with him, but not, not sufficiently. No, I mean, on no. this key, on, on the key you, you no. wouldn't. So no, if you were in Hillary Benn's shoes, you would not well, remain uh, yeah, in but, the but, but hang on. But, uh, but as, as Foreign Secretary in a British government, you're in a very different position from if you're a shadow Foreign Secretary in, in the opposition. Uh, and this is not the first time that senior opposition leaders have disagreed. Uh, that happened in the 1950s. Um, it wasn't particularly pretty, and it's not particularly pretty at the moment. But it's a fact of life. And in opposition, where you're not making decisions in government... So it doesn't matter. Well, it, well, it, it matters, but it doesn't have the same effect. But when and, you've uh, got those divisions, as you've said you have, Jack Straw, you know, you can't really be an effective opposition. You've got your Labour leader saying he's opposed, it wants unilateral nuclear disarmament. I know you've got this massive review now that's going to take a while on the future of Trident, the nuclear warheads, whether they should go on the submarines or not. But... I mean, when you've got a leader like that, who there's a large part of the Parliamentary Labour Party who disagree with him, I mean, his days are numbered, surely. I, I don't think his day, days are numbered at all. And he's, he's uh, democratically elected. It was not a system he devised. And we have to, the rest of the party has got to accept that he was elected perfectly fairly by a system for, over which he had no control. And you can't blame a candidate for using uh, the, the system. I don't happen to agree with Jeremy on a lot of things, as it happens. Uh, I do, he and I were in the same page on the future of Iran, uh, but he was democratically elected. One way or another, the Parliamentary Party and Jeremy Corbyn's uh, leadership will have to reach some accommodation. It's a painful process and it's the first time this has happened for very, 50 years. Jack Straw, thank you very much. Indeed, thank for you coming very much. on Hard Talk. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you.